All right. Uh, back to uh, one of my favorite favorite things of the year, which is when we get to interview and just chat with the authors uh, from our book club. And most recent uh, this week is this, this is one I've been looking to for a while, looking forward to for a while. Mr. Michael Easter, uh, author of Scarcity Brain and The Comfort Crisis, for the record. I don't want to take that away from you because that was an awesome book as well. But we'll probably focus more on Scarcity Brain today since we just read that and uh, and it's fresh on our minds. And uh, I'm excited to have this chat. So thanks for thanks for joining us today, Michael. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really psyched to be here. This will be fun. Yeah. Um well, let's 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 dive into this. Uh, like I like I told you before we got going, this will kind of be free flowing, and we'll take it whatever direction it goes. But I gotta I gotta know, like when it came to writing this book, um, I remember you telling a story. I forget which podcast it was on, but I, I think you're at a gas station. You look over, you realize why are, why are they playing the slot machines? Was is did I get that right? At like 7 a.m. in the morning, if I yeah. recall the story yeah, correctly. Not just like at a gas station, but yeah, but at 7 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, 7 a.m. gas station slot machine playing. So, yeah, I live in Las Vegas, which not not too far uh, from you guys, but yeah, there's there's slot machines all over this town, right? I mean, it's it's not just the gas stations. And by the way, they're in like every gas station. It's the grocery stores. It is the airport, right? Right as you get off the plane, there you're just assaulted with slot machines, um, restaurants, bars, everything, and people play them all the time, like around the clock. And so my background is I'm a you know I'm a journalist, and specifically on behavior, psychology, wellness, questions like that. And so when I see that, I just see something that seems totally irrational, right? It's like the house always wins. This town wouldn't exist if the house didn't win. Vegas isn't a town built on winners. And so then my next question is, okay, well, if this is irrational, why are people doing it? And um, that led me to, as you read in the book, the uh, that casino lab, which, you know, journalism getting getting from the observation of the slot machine into the casino lab in the book is like, you talk to this person who tells you to talk to this person who tells you to talk to this person who refers you to a guy they maybe know, but I think this is still his cell phone number, but why don't you send him a text? And you know, it's just this roundabout way. And that, yeah, that put me in the, uh, the laboratory that is a fully working, breathing, cutting edge casino where uh, they're just using it to study human behavior. And that's where I learned how a slot machine works. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. Was that, is that Black Fire Innovation? Is that the name of the, the company yeah. that, that owns that? Uh, I, if I remember correctly, it's like a collaboration of a bunch, maybe 60, 70 different companies that have, that have invested in that. Um, I, you know, I find it interesting. One of the things I felt, I found myself thinking about as I read your book uh, and as, as, as I listened to other interviews you did too, on the, on the data you came up with was there's this part of like, how much of this is natural? It shows up in us in humans where like you mentioned, like, okay, we know we're going to lose. The reality is you play enough hands, you lose, or you, or you play enough spins, you lose. Uh, and so there's this natural thing that happens no matter what organic, if you will. And then there's, and we have people literally studying and investing millions of dollars to make sure we, we can't not play. And for me, the thing, I, the question that kept coming up is like, at what level is this okay? And you know what I mean? Or where, where's the, where's the level? And I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I, I believe in capitalism big time, but I also, I, where's the part where we look out for humans? And at what point is this? I'm super fascinated with human behavior. Um, I'd like to think that I like, I'm fascinated in it so I can be a better person. And at what point are we, is that going, you know, the, the other way, did you, did you ever have any of those thoughts as you were learning all this? Dude, I spent like three, four years of my life reporting on this and I still grapple with the same question. And I think it, it's such a hard question to answer, but kind of where I've landed is that I think that most behaviors that people get hooked on like slot machines, like 
social media where there are people literally looking at data and going like, this is how we're going to get people to do this more. Um, I think that for most people, most of the time, these behaviors that are fun in the short term, but can hurt us in the long term, they actually don't hurt my, most people. All right. So if you look at problem gambling rates, the rates are relatively low. If you look at truly problematic, say tech use, um, the rates are actually relatively low. But I think the, the the problem is that is we have so many different things today. When you start to just bundle all the things together, like they're going to get you somehow. <laughs> and, um, but I think that because it is so ambiguous, it kind of, my message is to more empower people. Um, I think w when I think of something like slot machines and casinos, they're very heavily regulated, like unbelievably regulated. Um, but something like, for example, social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it might be, much less regulated. And so I do think that there's an element where for the time being, we really need to um, help people become aware of what goes on in the background, help people become aware of why they fall into some of the bad habits they do. And then, you know, what's the escape route out? Yeah. Kevin, as a follow-up to that, Michael, I want to ask you about, you know, teens and, and kids like on this same topic. Cause I heard you on another podcast and, and you, you, you may have even referenced a little bit in the book, but do you mind sharing just sort of your feelings? Like after doing all this research, there's sort of this idea of like, well, you know, like we, we, I think you talked in a podcast about alcohol as an example, right? Like most people don't abuse that. And so most people don't abuse social media, although there, there are some people that, that fall into that category, but when it comes to kids and just the, the study and the research and the effect that the social media stuff has out there. I'd love to love to hear your thoughts on that again. Yeah. So younger people are a more, we need more protections around younger people. And I'll explain why. It's basically because from about puberty to maybe about 20, um, but especially until about 18, people's brains change in such a way where they start to value certain things and certain behaviors become stronger than others. So teens are more likely to take risks. We've all been there, <laughs> right? Um, teens value being social more than at any other time in their life. And teens are figuring out how they sort of find comfort and escape and all these things during this time period. And so when you insert a behavior or a substance that um, could be high risk. They have a, they don't really realize how risky it could be one, but then two, if it provides sort of short-term comfort that they sort of are more likely to get hooked on that short-term escape or comfort. So a good stat on this is that uh, if someone has their first drink at age 14 or younger, they have a 50, 50 shot at developing an alcohol abuse problem later in life. If someone waits until they're 21 to have their first drink, their odds drop below 10%. And so then it's like, oh, I guess now it makes sense why we have a drinking age of 21, <laughs> right? But I think with social media is really kind of wild, wild example, because it touches on this need for teens to be very social and to care more about being social at any time in their life. It puts their social ranking a number behind their social ranking, which we've never had before. It's on you 24 seven. And it's also an escape for many people. So you start to hit like all these things at a time in a teen's life when they're sort of figuring out how they find escape or they really care about what people think about them, all these things. And you just sort of have this recipe for, um, not good things to happen. And I think that we see that in the data. And of course, it's like not every teen who's on social media is, is going to be affected. But when you look at general trends with teen mental health, you're seeing that things start to really go in a bad direction about the time that we get social media apps on smartphones. And I'm curious to take that a little bit deeper. Did you come to any conclusions around um okay so like you gave you just gave the stat of if you don't 
you know, drink until you first drink when you're 21. Um, I'm not going to say that it's harmless, but it's, you know, a lot less likely to, to impact you negatively. It, is there an age? Are there any studies out there yet that says if we delay, say, social media until X age, um, it's, it's less likely to make a negative impact? Uh, here's what I'll say is that there's a lot of, so probably the leading voice on this is a guy named Jonathan Haidt, and he's a researcher at NYU. He just had a big book come out about this. Um, and his argument is that we should wait until we should have basically a ban or a limit. I'm trying to think what the right language would be. Basically, you have to be at least 16 to be able to be on social media. And also, we need legislation that would actually force social media companies to check because right now you have to be thir be 13 and there's plenty of like nine-year-olds walking around just who wrote, yeah, I'm 13, <laughs> you know, and they get on or whatever. So um, having some age verifications. Now, I honestly think, I honestly think it'd be fine if it were 18. It's like having it be 18, I think would give uh, kids more time, like as they go through the education system and high school to interface more one-on-one, -on -one, to focus more on um, sports, in-person interactions and academics rather than worrying about the quantification of their social status. Yeah, that's great. Um, not to get too far backwards, but when, when I was asking you the question about Black Fire Innovation and kind of the morality, I guess, is, is the word I'm looking for. I guess what, what came to mind for me when you, when you gave your answer was uh, I think of one of my very favorite authors uh, is, is Robert Greene. And a lot of a lot of people have a negative, like they won't even finish reading the book. Sometimes they won't get past the first chapter, his first book, 48 Laws of Power. And I'm telling the advice I give people is no, 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 that's a warning. This is a this is a book of warnings. It's not a how to manual. And so I guess, you know, I now that I'm, you know, kind of looking at some of the data and the the information here in scarcity brain, I look at it as like, okay, this is this is a warning and it's a guidebook to know this is how number one, how we are wired to work. And number two, that we should know that people are using that sort of sort of against us. And we've we've got to then, you know, leverage the other way. Is there yeah. is there any one, you know, I guess not one thing, but are there a couple of things that as you finish this book up, you realize like, hey, Here's where I've got to, at least in my life, use this information to kind of fight against the fact that there's, you know, millions and millions of dollars being spent on grabbing my attention and putting me into the scarcity loop. Yeah. You mean me personally? Yeah. Just, and, and it may be you personally, or maybe just that the, anybody that, you know, anyone walking the earth could, could use as well. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, let me think on that one. Yeah, I think for me personally, um, <clears throat> what was really enlightening for me as I reported this book is that, so this three-part behavior loop that I talk about called the scarcity loop, which is is what slot machines leverage to get people hooked. It's what um, social media uses to, it's basically this random rewards system, right? Um, but the thing is, is you can use that same system for good. So I'll give you a great example of that. And so actually I should probably break down what the scarcity loop is. So I, I'm sure you all kind of know if you read the book, but I'll just go over it just as a reminder. Um, it's got opportunity, unpredictable rewards and quick repeatability, right? So if you have an opportunity to get something of value, in the case of the slot machine, it's money. You've got unpredictable rewards. So with the slot machine, you know you'll get money at some point if you keep playing, but you don't know when, and you don't know how much could be a loss. Any game could be a loss. You could win a few bucks. You could win $200,000, right? Crazy range of outcomes. And then quick repeatability, you could immediately repeat the behavior. So you just keep going and going and going. So that's what makes slot machines compelling. That's what makes social media compelling. That's why people get, why people check their emails so much because it's like, you might get an email that like the deal fell through or the deal went through, right? It's like, you're gonna be checking your email a bunch that day. Um, you can also use that for good. So a great example that I have is uh, I'm, I have a friend whose name is John Hankey and I wrote about him in the book and he noticed that his son, 
was really into video games. Like, great, but so much into video games that he wasn't spending time with other kids. He wasn't getting outside. He wasn't being active. So what John did is he leveraged the scarcity loop by putting it in a game called Pokemon Go where people walk around outdoors with others playing this random rewards game to go find Pokemon on this like augmented reality thing through their phone. So it's basically kind of the idea of like sneaking in the broccoli into the mac and cheese, <laughs> right? It's like humans are naturally attracted to this scarcity loop and there's good evolutionary reasons for that. And if you can find a way to um, leverage it in a way where you're doing all these things that are really good for you, then that's like the, one of the ultimate hacks of getting uh, falling into a habit that's going to be positive. So that's something I think about a lot personally, and I find it, you find it a lot in nature. Um, great. So it actually evolved to help humans find food and hunt. And one of my hobbies is hunting for that reason, right? It allows me to go out into nature. I'm looking for animals. I'll do it for like, you know, weeks at a time. I have to keep physically fit year round for the type of backcountry hunting I do. Uh, and it is that scarcity loop because I have an opportunity to fill my freezer with meat for the year, but I have no idea where the animal is going to be. I don't know how anything is going to turn out. And I just keep going and going and going until something happens more or less. And in the process, I'm getting all these good things. So I think if you can find a way to unlock that, that can be really transformative for people. On the, on the other end where it's being used in ways that are perhaps negative, I think the best thing, and I, you can tweak any of the three parts of the loop to slow down the behavior, but I think the most powerful one is tweaking the quick repeatability. That is to say, if you can find impediments <laughs> to how easy it is to re repeat a behavior, that'll slow down the behavior. So for example, with cell phones and apps you use too much, there's this application that I use call, called ClearSpace. And with ClearSpace, what you do is it's an app you download and you basically tell it, here's the app I want to limit on my phone that I use too much. And you go, okay. And so then let's say you pick Twitter because you just compulsively check Twitter. When you go to open Twitter in the future, it'll say, hey, do you really want to use Twitter? And you got to go yes or no. And so you click yes. Okay. And then it'll say, all right, you want to use Twitter? Great. Let's take a breath together, right? Five, 10 seconds, you breathe in, you breathe out. Then it shows you this nice quote. And then you have to choose how long are you going to use Twitter? Do you want to use it for two minutes? Do you want to use it for five minutes? Do you want to use it for 15 minutes? Take a pick. And only then can you use Twitter. So what this does is it slows down the behavior. Because when you think about when people, like how many times have you found yourself in an app and you're like, I don't even know how I got here. I just compulsively opened it because I'm so used to checking it. Could be LinkedIn, could be Twitter, could be Instagram, could be your email, whatever it is. It immediately slows down that behavior. And then you have to decide, oh, I, I actually wanted to use this app. Great. And then you have to get intentional with how long you're going to use it. Because a lot of these apps, let's say it's Twitter, you go into, you know, reply to a DM, but then 45 minutes later, you're down some rabbit hole and you haven't even replied to the DM yet, right? So you've you've got to get intentional with your your use time. And I think there's a lot of different ways you can think about slowing down some of these quick, repeatable behaviors. Yeah, that's, uh, man, how, I got to ask, like, how long have you used that app and you like that? Like, is it working well for you? It's, yeah, it's awesome. Now I'll say here's, I had written, uh, so I have the, a newsletter called the 2% newsletter and I had written a piece, uh, on there. It goes out three times a week about, uh, research on changing your phone to grayscale. So there's a really fascinating study where scientists had people change their phone to grayscale, which means your, your screen is just only black and white. And it reduced screen time by about 40 minutes. And the reason for that is because colors are stimulating. Colors direct behavior. And you might be thinking, what do you mean by that? Well, if you see a red, so if you see a red sign, what do you do? You stop. If you see a green light, what do you do? You go. Right. So colors are like colors cue behavior. 
they're stimulating. When you reduce color, it just makes things a lot more boring. There's not as many cues about exactly what you should do. And so all of a sudden your phone becomes a lot more, a lot less stimulating. So you use it less. So I had written about that and um, a guy reached out to me. He's this kid and he goes, Hey, I got this app called clear space. Me and a friend started the company. They were in uh, Y combinator, which is like this tech startup thing. And it's this app you use to reduce your phone screen time, you know, and I wrote back and I go, okay, so let me, exp let me understand this in order to use one app less, I have to download your app, <laughs> you know? And he goes, look, just trust me. So I go, okay, I'll trust you. And it totally works. And the reason it works, I mean, is it just goes back to behavioral psychology and the fact that the faster and easier you can repeat a behavior that's rewarding to you in some way, the more likely you are to repeat that behavior. And so by inserting that pause, it totally works. And I did, uh, I did a fun clear space challenge on my newsletter and we had like, we had a couple thousand people sign up and the messages I got afterwards about how much less people were using the apps that they found themselves using way too much. It was crazy. It was great. Was there, I'm, I'm curious, was there, and I have my assumption on the answer, was there a theme on the apps? Like, was there a clear winner, say like, say like a Twitter or a Instagram or Facebook or TikTok? What did like, did people share which app or apps they were going to limit? And did yeah. you post a pattern on that? It was all apps that have random rewards. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email was a big one, especially for people in the business world. Um, trying to think what else. Yeah. But I mean, if you, if you think about, if you think about the apps that you get, um, that people use too much, they all lean on that scarcity loop of the fact that, you know, you're going to, you might get something at any point when you check, but you don't know when you don't know if it's going to be good. You don't know if it's going to be bad. It's all, it all leans on random rewards. You know, no one gets hooked on Google maps. No one gets hooked on like all trails or whatever, right? It's like there, there has to be some sort of random unpredictableness to the app or else it's, it's not going to be that really, it's not going to hook you more or less. Was there any surprises in your, in your research for the book? Like, you know, you covered things like food and drugs, obviously social media, um, you know, you talked to, I think his, his last name was when I'm forgetting his first name, but you talked about the gentleman you met at the, Oh yeah. yeah. Street. Uh, so you covered social media quite a bit in, in all of your research. Was there, was there anything that you were surprised? Like, wow, I didn't realize there was a scarcity loop going on here, but it's very clear as you, as you dig into it. Yeah. I think there was a couple areas. I think one was food. Um, I didn't expect it to necessarily be in food. Um, I don't think it's as strong in food and dialed as it is in say a slot machine, but I talked to a guy who was an executive for a junk food company. And he basically told me if you want to get a junk food to sell and sell a lot, it's got to have three V's. It's got to have value, uh, meaning relatively affordable. It's got to have variety, meaning that, um, the flavors are sort of, <laughs> they're exciting. And there's also a lot of different options. So, you know, we can't just have one flavor of Doritos. We got to have like 29 flavors of Doritos. <laughs> and then finally is, and the most important one is velocity, meaning that the food is, uh, you can eat the food really fast. And, um, that's really what makes the junk food industry work. And that is just another way of describing the scarcity loop. Right. And you see this in research too, when people eat foods that are ultra processed, which is kind of a, a scientific term for junk food. People eat about 500 calories more across the day compared to if they were eating unprocessed food. And that's simply because the foods are much faster to eat and you eat them and eat them. And it takes your um, brain, like the chemical signals for telling you that you're full, um, can't catch up quick enough to your eating when the foods are these sort of highly processed foods that are faster to eat. Does that make sense? Yeah. I remember one of the stories you talked after visiting, uh, the, is it the Chumani tribe? Did I pronounce that correctly? 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no one pronounces that right. And you nailed it. <laughs> and you, you decided you challenged yourself to, to eat their diet at once, even once you got back home for, was it 30 days? Um, yeah, 30 days. How, what was that experience like for you? And, and I, the thing that stuck out to me is like, you I think you even used the word, like you had to labor through some meals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the, so this tribe, they're, they're really fascinating because they don't die of heart disease and, um, heart disease, even though it doesn't get a lot of coverage, um, you don't like, people don't really worry about it when you look at Google search trends about what people worry about is going to kill them, but it is by far the number one killer of people worldwide. And this Chimane tribe, they don't get heart disease and it seems to go back to what they eat. And, um, yeah, their food is just totally unprocessed. They're eating just single ingredient foods that are not super exciting, but it seems to keep their health really in check. And so, yeah, I, I went and lived with the tribe for a while. Then I go home to your point, I'm going to replicate it. And so it's like, I got to eat things like fish, rice, vegetables, fruit, lean meats. I mean, there's not much else. It's all just foods that have one ingredient. And as I'm planning to do this, it's like, all right, I go into my pantry and I'm like, let's see what I can eat in here. And I count like a hundred something items. And I think only 10 to 15 of them counted as under this like single ingredient thing, right? It's just like, oh my God. And that's totally normal. So like 70% of what people eat is ultra processed food, meaning it has a bunch of ingredients, highly processed. And so then I go to Costco because it's like, I don't have any food at home. And I would walk like entire aisles and there's just nothing you could eat. And so I'm having to be like, okay, I got a bag of rice. I got like some frozen fish. I've got like some fruit. And then just like the vast majority of the store is off limits. And then when I, when I eat this food, because it is so, um, it's very filling per calorie. So that's one of the big differences is that junk food concentrates calories. So if you, you can think about it like this, it's like a, a potato, an ounce of just like a boiled potato maybe has 50 calories. An ounce of a potato chip probably has like 250 calories. So you can understand, like, if you think about filling your stomach with a certain amount of food, like you're going to eat fewer calories if the food is unprocessed. Now, I didn't necessarily want to really lose weight, though. So in order to maintain my weight while eating this Chimane diet, I started losing weight pretty fast. And I'm like, I don't want to get under, like, I don't want to lose too much weight, right? I had to labor through meals. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. I'd be sitting eating lunch like, Oh my God, this feels just like a marathon of eating. I can't believe I still have this many potatoes left to eat. <laughs> so, so basically anybody who wants to eat less, just go with the single ingredient that that's going to work. You might find yourself having a hard time even eating what you, what yeah. you need to. Yeah. I wrote a, um, this is probably somewhere in the archives on my newsletter, but I wrote this piece more than a year ago about uh, potatoes and how potatoes are the most filling food per calorie. And so if you're trying to like lose weight and don't want to be as hungry, just eating plain potatoes is like the ultimate food you could eat. And they're also fascinating because they have the most, uh, like you can basically live off of potatoes. And um, so finding foods like that, that are really simple are going to fill you up more per calorie. That's funny that you say that. Um, the when I was oh gosh, so twenty five years ago, I, I lost like two hundred pounds, and um, I ate a potato probably five or six nights a week with my dinner, and I, I just was like, I had a I, to, for me, I was just strictly calorie counting. I you know I didn't I obviously didn't know any of this back then, um, but as you share that, I I. I think back to that, like I literally had a baked potato probably five nights a week uh, on average for a year and a half, two years. So yeah. that, that tracks. Totally. That's pretty, that's pretty intense. Um, 
Hey, Kevin, I want to jump in real quick and just say, Michael, uh, first of all, I think you're a great storyteller. I, I told Kevin this, like I I, uh, I read some of the book hardcover. I also listened to some of it. I enjoyed you reading certain chapters. And so the chapter on food where you were in Costco and just like you and your wife going back and forth, like had me cracking up. I just want to let you know that. And um, I, this is a little bit of an offshoot question, but it, it's something that, you know, most of the people that receive this book, like we're in sales. And so being a great storyteller is something that I'll just tell you, like I've been trying to get better at. So I wanted to ask you, and I don't, maybe you've never thought of yourself this way, but I, I consider you a great storyteller. Like I, I heard it in the book over and over and over again. How did you develop that skill and any books or recommendations for those of us that want to get better at storytelling that, that you would have? That may be a little feel like an off the wall question, but I just admired you for it. It, it was like something that came up over and over in, in the book for me. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, what comes to mind is that, so every story has to stand for something larger, right? Stories are just a, a way to walk the reader or the listener or the customer into the bigger idea. So I usually will start with like a, a big idea and it's, I need to communicate this idea. So in the book, we'll use the food chapter because we're talking about it. I need to communicate this big idea that the way that our food system has changed has hurt our health. And that going back to how people ate for thousands of thousands of years is going to lead to some benefits. Now, if I just start talking about that, I'm going to lose people, right? It's like, okay, why do I care? So once you have the big idea, you need to find a story that gets you there. And so for me, I, ha I do a lot of research and I find like, what's an interesting, what's an interesting way to communicate that through story. And so it was finding the research on the Chimane and then actually going down there and meeting with them and then trying the diet and walking people through the story behind that all so I can get to the big idea. So I always do this, like, I'll do it right here. Um, like this little circle to big circle. So the big circle is the big idea. And then you need to find the little circle is just the story that gets you into the big idea. Cause people won't just buy into the big idea. If you're like, here's a big thought I have, but they will, if you go, oh man, one day, and then it eventually walks them in. So there's that. And then every story ultimately has to be about change. So if I tell you, you know, if I tell you some anecdote about, oh yeah, we, you know, me and my friends the other night, um, we went out to this restaurant and this crazy thing happened. And can, can you believe it? That was crazy. Nothing changed. That's just like an anecdote. That's just like a retelling of some things that happened in a chronological order. You need to have the main character in the story start thinking one thing or behaving one way. And then as they go through this narrative, they learn things that ultimately change them. That, mm. ulti that is what a story is, is it needs to end in change. Every story is about change. So thinking of what's the big idea I want to communicate and then what story can I use to get in there? And then how is a change occurring across as I'm telling that story? I need to, I need to, the character to start at point A and end at point B. And this is like, this is it. Probably everyone is familiar with the hero's journey um, with Joseph Campbell's work, which I got a whole, like from there to about there is all Campbell books. <laughs> um, all the, all the myths throughout history they all have that exact same theme. It's it's that we have a character, they go through some sort of ordeal or trial, and along the way they're tested, they learn new things, and they come out the other side, a different person um, with a new way of thinking. And so in a lot of the old myths, for example, you know, the, the hero or heroine would go out and they would find the chalice or the grail or whatever it was, and they would bring it back to society. But that, But the chalice and the grail is not what we're actually talking about here. That's just a metaphor for these sort of internal changes and different ways of viewing the world that the character came back with. It's awesome, man. I'm taking some notes right now. Just so you know, I asked that question very selfishly because Kevin knows a few months ago, I asked a friend of ours, I was like, I want to get better at storytelling. I mean, we lead people, we, we sell things to people and, and there's something to be said about 
people that are really great at that and how they can cause people to make changes quicker. And so I just admire that about you. Thanks for sharing that. Well, thanks. Yeah, of course. I'm going to take it to a lighter note. Uh, if I, if I got this quote, right, forgive me, or if I forgive me, if I didn't, but I got to be close. I think you said Moneyball ruined the soul of baseball. Is that, <laughs> did I hear that right? Uh, I, tell me, tell me more about that. This is a total selfish question for me because I love that book. Uh, and, and I learned a lot from it, but I'm also a baseball fan. So I, I think I get where you're coming from on it, but, but tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. So this is in the chapter about numbers and how once we quantify things, we often focus entirely on the number and the quantification and we lose why we do the thing we do in the first place. Okay. So you have to back up and ask, what is the point of baseball? I'm asking you, what's the point of baseball? I mean, it's, it's fun. Uh, I think it's entertainment. Yeah. It's entertaining kind of a metaphor for life. It's like, there's all these different things that baseball is about, but ultimately it's an, it's an entertainment product. I think at the end of the day, great. So when teams start to really focus on the money ball aspect of the game, it becomes like, we've got to win and we've got to do it in this like really efficient way, abiding by the numbers, but what the numbers say isn't necessarily good for entertainment, right? So it's like, we're going to shift our defense to be able to predict where this batter is going to hit. We're going to make, we're going to take certain measures to like really calculate everything. And what tends to happen over time is that, um, team, like you get fewer hits in the field and teams have to win on the very, on the rare occasion that they get a home run. Right. And so the, the fans, meanwhile, are kind of sitting around as there's like all this kind of predictable stuff happening. There's, there's less action happening in the game, except for the rare event that you get the home run. And that doesn't necessarily make the game an entertainment product as much of an entertainment product. So this is why baseball basically becomes boring. And so this is why the league starts to make um, changes to pitch counts to really speed things up. Cause that'll help with, um, with the boredom problem. It also has teams like you can't shift all your players around for like a batter anymore. Um, and that's, so there's more randomness and random rewards in the game. And so by inserting that back in the entertainment value starts to go back up, but it's like, and this, this is kind of a rule with anything. Like anytime we start to quantify things and really measure and just strive specifically for this one measure, we often miss the overall point. So the anecdote I use in the book, I use a few of them, but grades are a good example. Another one is when uh, Robert Parker started scoring wines. It's like wine is a very complex thing. You eat it with food, it changes. It's a social thing. It's like this whole experience. And when he starts uh, quantifying, giving scores to wines, that clarity of the score, people go, oh, well, the bottle that scored a 90 is better than the one that scored an 80, right? Like, I'm going to buy that one. And what ends up happening is that those bottles that get the high score fly off the shelf and the ones who don't just kind of sit there and gather dust. So you start to have these winemakers who've been making all these different, more interesting wines for thousands of years. They start to go, oh, well, we don't sell ones that get 80. We need wines that get a 90. And this changes how they make wine. But the problem with the measurement, though, is that this guy, in order to give these wines an objective score, he's like, he's not drinking drinking them with food or anything like that. And that totally changes the experience of wine. And so it changes the industry. It changes why people buy wine. It changes the experience of, of drinking wine. And it starts to kind of like really devalue and, and change things. That's, you know, that's a really good point. I think of, um, I I loved Moneyball, like literally the book and when it first came out and I, I enjoyed knowing that the A's were doing something different than everybody else. And it was kind of like, while it was different, while they were sort of going against the grain, it was awesome. And then it got to the point where it was like, this, 
this is kind of boring. And I would imagine the same thing with the wine that that example you just gave is great. You also just mentioned grades. And I've also heard you talk about getting administrators to do away with them would basically be impossible. But as a professor, let me ask you, if, if UNLV came down and said, Hey, we're going to do away with letter grades. Um, how would you feel? How, like, how would you feel about, it? would you run with that? Would you, would you feel better about it? Would you, would it change well, the way you teach? I would totally be okay with it. I would, I would love it. Um, because my students, my students would obsess about grades and that's because it's like very clear, right? It's just like clear measurement. Um, it's another example where, you know, most of my students go into school thinking like the point is to get the good grade. It's like, well, yeah, kind of, because that's important for like employment down the road and stuff. But really the point of college is like, there are so many different points of going to college, like why you go, you go to make friends, you go to learn to, to be a responsible human being. You learn how to think, you learn how to unpack arguments, you learn all these things along the way. But with the sort of clearness of grades, students just obsess about grades and what gets you a good grade doesn't necessarily mean you've actually learned how to master the material and use it in the right application. It's kind of like, it just incentivizes like rote memorization in, take the test, get the A, throw it out, move on to the next one. So I think that, you know, I'll speak from my own writing career. What actually made me a good writer wasn't just turning in an assignment and say you get an A or whatever on it. It was when the professor or an editor or whatever would walk through, would heavily edit all my writing, right? And just tell me exactly how to think, what I needed to do. And I think that sometimes doesn't happen with grades. It's just like, hey, here's your A, whatever. But you don't learn in the process. You don't necessarily learn to think. And the, to your point, what you said is like the whole reason we have grades, grades weren't created to help students actually master the material and learn to think and learn to understand and learn to unpack things. They were just made to make the lives of administrators easier because you, it's very hard to move a lot of people through the system if they're all getting these long written evaluations from the 24 different classes they took, right? It's hard to deal with all that. So grades, like, you know, the GPA, it just immediately tells someone kind of a general consensus on how the person did. But even with my own students, I noticed that the people who got straight A's, they were slightly more likely to be robotic. Whereas the people who might've been in the B plus to A minus range, they, they had they would often get those grades because they were a little bit free thinking. They were going to experiment. They were going to do, you know, kind of different things against the grain. And that wasn't always reflected in, in the A's. Yeah. It also makes me think of, um, as someone, someone who you're friends with Peter Atia, who talks about BMI is terrible for the, on the individual level, it, it tells you nearly nothing, but it's great for understanding a population. Uh, yeah. And understanding something at a glance, which, which I think is kind of the way you reference grades uh, in a, in a lot of ways. It's like okay, we can tell at a glance without having to really dig into what's going on here, what they're learning. Um, speaking of the, speak, speaking of you know, talking to young people and impacting uh, kids, I, I gotta know does does some of your uh, connections and some of you, I mean, you've been on some amazing podcasts like does that that help with the street cred with the, uh, with college students by chance that, that you're talking to Peter Atia and Joe Rogan and I think Rich Roll and whoever else, uh, that, that you get to talk to about these books. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always, um, college students, a lot of them listen to Rogan. <laughs> That's the big one. And so I'll always have like this moment, some midway in the semester when you get the students who's like, I looked you up on the internet. You were on Rogan. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was on Rogan. And they're like, how is he? You know, they ask all these questions about Rogan. So definitely gives me some street cred. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I, I got to say, I, we're here to talk about scarcity branding, but I, I, I would be remiss if I ignored the comfort crisis book there over your other shoulder. Um, amazing book. And quite frankly, um, and I told you this when we met last last summer was that's the reason I started started rucking 
was the, there's this one chapter in there and I'm certain you're responsible. Uh, you are to blame for at least uh, all, a couple million Instagram posts. I'm certain of at this point <laughs> because, because of rucking. But so one thing I want to share with you, then a question. Um, what I didn't tell you is had different random heart problems over the, not different problems, one, one specific problem over the last uh, year now. And for a long time, my exercise was very limited, but the one thing I was allowed to do was rock. And so it's pretty cool. Cause I could, I could actually go out and do that every day. Uh, so thank you for that. Cause I genuinely would not have rocked had it not been for that chapter in your book, but that book made me feel like such a wimp that I was like, I got to do something to make life harder. Fine. I'll put the weight in the backpack and go. Um, what's it, what is, what is the, What's that done for you? Because I got to imagine you don't write Comfort Crisis for the sake of rucking, but you are, let's face it, you're responsible for probably tens of thousands of people at this point rucking. What's that feel like? It, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's like one of those things. I mean, it's helping people, you know, and I think that that also goes back to um, Fred's question about storytelling, right? It's like, People have been carrying stuff in sacks for millions of years. And we kind of forgot about it. And it just needed the right story behind it and the right gathering of information and rationale, why it's important, why humans are built to do it and what it can do for us to really get people to take action. And so, yeah, it was just, you know, it's cool to, I, I mean, I kind of stumbled upon it. For example, when I sent in the proposal for the comfort crisis, there was not anything in the proposal about rucking. And really the unlock for me was I, you know, I knew that humans had evolved to run long distances in the heat. That's one of the things that humans are uniquely capable of. So generally humans are athletically pathetic. Like we're not strong. We're not that agile. We're not fast. You know, I mean, we're just like, eh, we're pretty mediocre but we are good at uh, running long distances in the heat. And we would do that in order to hunt animals as we evolve. So we would run animals down slowly, but surely other animals can't cool themselves. And so eventually those animals would get heat exhaustion and then we just, we'd kill them. And this might take 10 miles. But then the other part is once you hunt the animals successfully, what do you have to do? You got to carry it all the way back to camp. And so in the comfort crisis, I'm on this long hunting expedition and when we finally um, successfully hunt a caribou and we're taking out every part of it that we legally can, we have to pack it back to camp. And it occurs to me in that moment, like, oh, wait a minute. Humans are the only mammal that can carry stuff for distance. And I wonder, I wonder how that shapes us too. And so that led me down the rabbit hole to ultimately uh, write the chapter. And I think that probably the lesson there too is you know, it's easy to do research on the internet, but if you're researching everything on the internet, that means someone else already figured that thing out too, right? And so I think experience can be one of the greatest teachers and lead you into insights that maybe aren't already out there. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Did I, did I hear you say uh, that you ruck with a hundred pounds when you're getting ready for a, for a hunt? <laughs> Uh, not quite a hundred, but what I will do is I will, um, I'll get on the treadmill and I'll do the heaviest or the highest incline. It'll do usually like 15 to 25. And I'll just slowly walk uphill with maybe like 80, uh, for like an hour, two hours. You just feel like an absolute pack mule. I mean, I'm going slow. I'm going like two miles an hour. It's just like a slog, but then when it comes time to actually like pack out an animal, I can, I can do that. So. That's wild, man. I, uh, you, that, that's a lot. 80 pounds is a lot. Um, especially at a, at that, that type of incline. So kudos, kudos to you was, um, reading scarcity brain. Fred and I were talking about this. I think yesterday was scarcity brain, like a natural follow-up to comfort crisis because it, or did it just coincide? They feel like to me, like they, they go well together. Is that just because they came from, from you or is it, was there a little bit of thought process there with it? Um, yeah, it's funny. 
I had a, so a lot of times what authors will do is once you turn in the draft for one book, you start the proposal for another and you try and sell that before the, the book you just finished comes out. And that one oddly came from my editor texts me. Um, his name's Matthew. He's a great dude. He's a funny dude. He was raised by like back to the land people in Vermont, went to university of Vermont, a uh, huge fish fan, just kind of this hippie, like granola dude. He sends me a text and he's like, what if your next book is called scarcity brain? And I said, okay, what's that book about? And he goes, I don't know. I just think the title's cool. <laughs> and I go, all right, I'll come up with a proposal. <laughs> so I come up with this proposal for the book and um, I didn't think they really kind of related, but I was like, oh, I think I think this could be interesting. And um, as I got deeper into it, I realized that they're very much like kind of different viewpoints on the same theme, which I think is that, you know, the world has changed in such a way that isn't exactly um, always helping us and that you have to kind of embrace short-term discomfort in different ways and ask deeper questions in order to live well today. That's cool. That's funny how that, how it works out like that, right? Glad yeah. you asked that, Kevin. That's interesting. Hey, uh, Michael, if you don't mind, I want to toss this at you as we're kind of winding down. Maybe Kevin, you have one more question, but you, you ended, you know, scarcity brain with the, with the chapter on happiness. And like, I thought you did a great job of sort of defining that, like trying to define happiness is, is a challenge. The book's been out, seven months or so now. Uh, I got the impression that you went to visit those monks roughly two years ago, maybe 2022, if I picked it up correctly in, in the book. I'm just I'm just curious, like you're sitting here a couple years later since that experience, that story, the book's been out now seven months. Like how would you encapsulate this whole, you know, chapter on happiness or any additional thoughts that you have? Like, it's just, it's kind of this big, big thing, right? But um I'm just curious kind of where you're at as you've sat with that, that topic for a little longer now. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that, um, is harder to define than I think we maybe read. And I also don't think that there is a perfect path to happiness. There's not like this. Oh yeah. Go from point A to point B to point C. And I think that sometimes like in, you know, popular articles and even by a lot of, uh, researchers, it does get communicated that way. It's like, oh, you have to, you must gratitude journal. You must meditate. You must have a certain number of friends. You must be social, all these different things. And like, while that absolutely does work for a lot of people, it doesn't work for everyone. And I think like part of the journey of, you know, living kind of an examined life is really figuring out what does bring you sort of deeper satisfaction? And I think the one commonality that you tend to see across people, whether it's the monks in the monastery where I visited, which, you know, nothing they do aligns with all this advice we all get every day. And yet they are on average significantly more happy than the average person. From monks like that to sort of uh, leaders in business who are very happy to just, you know, average people is that there's a focus on something bigger beyond sort of the, the worldly trappings that people can fall into, you know, titles, buying stuff, getting a certain number in the bank account, whatever it might be. There's usually some bigger purpose and they're doing it for some higher reason often that will help other people. And so, how you get there is there's a lot of paths and, you know, the, <laughs> the, the promise, but also the peril of living is that like, you gotta, you gotta find your own path. And that's like, that's the interesting part of life, right? That's the journey. If there was an exact point A to point B to point C to point D, life wouldn't be that interesting. And so it's kind of like leaning, leaning into that and kind of exploring really where you sit on things, I think is, is like the way, you know? I'm going to, I'll end it with uh, more of a statement and then you can respond how how you want. Uh, I'm not sure I'd call this one a question either, but call the fucking Vatican. <laughs> yes. What's that? Oh, What's that mean? How is that? Uh, 
how's that helped you or, or maybe changed the way you think about things as you're in, you know, in your life as since that was said to you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do people know that story? We assume. I, uh, I mean, I hope so. If not, if you can tell it really quick, go for it. Yeah. So I'm, when I was, uh, <laughs> I was like a young gun in, uh, journalism and I was working at Esquire magazine. I'm like, you know, 22 or something. And, uh, I had gotten, I would, one of my jobs was to report this section that was, uh, I think it was called the answer fella. Basically people would write in just these random ass questions. And my job was to get, to answer them basically. And then I would send my research file over to this writer. Um, oh, I forget his name, but he's great. I would send my file. I'd first have to send it to my editor who would check it over and then send it to the writer. So what the question that I had was how much money does the Pope make? And so what I did is I like do, I Google all this stuff. Like how much does the Pope make? I even call up this ac Catholic academic guy who's kind of like gives me this vague answer. And I send the research file into my editor and I wait and I get an email back and it just says, meet me in the conference room in five minutes. So I'm like, okay. So I go in the conference room and it's in the Hearst building in New York. Right. So it's like it up on the, 30, 30 something floor. And, you know, like you can just see all of Manhattan and this dude is just sitting at the head of this long table and he's very Esquire, right? He's got like second button down and it's the end of a long day. And he's just like leaned back in his chair and I sit down and he's like, no, 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 no. If you want to know how much money the Pope makes, you call the fucking Vatican call the fucking Vatican. <laughs> and so to me, that's like very much, if you want to know something, you got to go right to the source, right? Because today it's very easy to just mess around online, to Google things, to like take the easy route. If you really want to fundamentally know and understand things, you got to put in the work and go right to the source. And I think that, that that's ultimately why um, that's definitely shaped how I think about writing books and articles and that I'm going to go places and talk to the actual people because I found like probably half the time what you read online is completely just like wrong. Like it's just wrong. Right. And so, you know, in the instance of the tribe, it's like, I had to go down and live with the tribe with the monks. It's like, I got to go live with them. And so I think obviously it's time intensive. You can't do it for everything, but if you have a really big project, I think putting in the work to go straight to the source and really figure things out is definitely worth it the payoff. Yeah. I would say it's clearly impacted you. I was going to bring up, I mean, going to the Amazon, you're going to Iraq, you go, you go into these casinos that are really research labs. Like you're, you're calling the fucking Vatican a lot. It seems like, and it's all, I love that story about just getting to the source. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great little story to just help remind ourselves of like, Hey, we just got to go experience things for ourselves if we really want to find it out. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Fred, you got any last words, buddy? No, I mean, I just encourage everybody out there listening, like, you know, pick up the comfort crisis so you don't have that one. And uh, the 2% is what the newsletter is called, right? I just recently myself subscribed to it. So I want to make sure I'm saying it the correctly. Yep. 2% newsletter. Um, you can sign up for it on my website, eastermichael.com. There's actually a Chimane diet challenge there that's two weeks that people have a lot of fun with. Um, or you can go to twopct.com, which is like the website that sort of houses the newsletter too. But yeah. Awesome. We'll get those links out to everybody too. And uh, Michael, thanks. Thanks a lot for being a good sport and taking the time to do this with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for, uh, thanks for reading the book and for the conversation. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we'll see you again soon, man. Have a great one. Yeah. Sounds good guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks Michael. Bye for now.